March, when this coronavirus first started, I started a sermon series called Unshakable. If you remember, it's about the life of Daniel. Daniel was, and, and all his people in Judah were invaded by the Babylonians. They were evicted from their homes and exiled to live in Babylon. And what we saw was a display of unshakable faith through all those challenges and difficulties. And it was something that we faced in the beginning of this coronavirus when we were exiled out of this building and confined into our own homes at first. And we were not able to worship together for the past almost seven months. Last week, I started a new sermon series called Exile. <clears throat> and it's about when the people of Judah heard the good news of report from the prophets, as God spoke through the prophets like Jeremiah and, and Isaiah, about this someday in the future when they would be able to return home. That was something of hope, a glimmer of hope in which they held on to until that day arrived. For us, today, we get to celebrate our return from exile, our return from being confined to our own homes in our weekly worship, and being able to come together and worship God together in our sanctuary. So today is a very special day of celebration. I want to continue in this look at the book of Ezra, another prophet. And this prophet was the one that spoke, as I mentioned last week online. This is the prophet that announced and reminded the people of Judah that they are about to go home. So I want you to listen as, as Ezra continues and describing the celebration of the people of Judah as they actually make that return home. I'm reading from Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. When the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, remember the Lord's temple, their place of worship, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets. And the Levites descended of Esaiah, Esaiah, no, I can't pronounce that correct. Close enough. <laughs> Uh, lost my place. And the Levites, descendants of Esai, clashed their symbols to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed. With praise and thanks, they sang their song to the Lord. He is so good. His faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord. This was a tremendous celebration. Imagine going, the, the actual time of the exile was around 70 years. Some people died while they were in exile. Some people lived through the entire thing and were able to return home. Some people were born into exile. But imagine the excitement of finally coming back to their homeland, finally coming and gathering around the foundation of the temple, the place of worship. The temple was actually destroyed by the Babylonians. So they're gathering around as they just pour the concrete, as they just create the foundation. They're gathering around, <clears throat> and they're excited. This is a massive celebration of praise to gather together to worship God for the first time for some over, for over 70 years. We've been away for seven months. We still, in 
can experience that sense of celebration this morning. And I hope that you do. They worship God with praise and thanksgiving. They exalted Him in celebration. They even wrote about it in Psalms. Listen as I read from Psalms 126, verses 1 to 3. When the Lord brought back His exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. And the other nation said, what amazing thing that the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Let me say that last part of that verse again. It says, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. This is the people of Babylon, or, or the, the current empire. These are the people that, that were not worshipers of the one true God. But they noticed there's something special about this God that opened the door for the Israelites to be able to come back into their homeland. They are the ones that said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. There's something powerful when God's people gather together for worship. There's something that catches the attention of people who don't know Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate our return from exile by worshiping together. Worship online is the best we can do under the circumstances that we have been facing. It's the best that some can do who cannot leave their own homes to come to a place of worship. I hope that the only reason that people don't go to a place of worship together in a church sanctuary is because they're either want to still be careful like the, those some of us among us that are still being careful about coming together with the coronavirus or they are physically incapable of coming. I hope that there's not one person in our community, in our church that doesn't come here because they simply do not have transportation. Amen? Amen. We get to celebrate. There's uh, Worshiping online is a poor substitute for being able to gather together. There's something powerful about the body of Christ getting together for worship. That's why Sunday morning is supposed to be a place where we gather together in a building, not just turning on a screen or turning on a TV. It's just not the same. It's not the same quality, not the same potential that when we gather as the body of Christ. God designed it for us to work together. And God designed it for us to worship together. That's where we find explosive power of God and an explosive presence of God. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. He says this, For where two or three or more gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Does this mean that God is not with us if we're by ourselves? No. God is with us at all times, wherever we are, by ourselves or in a crowd of people. But this passage says there's something special when two or more gather in his name, when two or more of his of those who choose to follow Jesus Christ, I'm not talking about just showing up for worship for one hour on a Sunday morning. I'm talking about people who commit their lives to follow Jesus Christ every day. When those people gather together, there's something special about the presence of God that's unique and better than just having the presence of God with us when we're by ourselves. There's a, a significant power of being connected to God in close relationship and with connected with each other in that same close relationship. There's something powerful when we are willing to, to, to get out of our sleep clothes and, and come into worship here into the sanctuary together. It's something powerful. When we, close, when we come in close proximity to our God 
and towards and with each other. When we worship together, when we work together, we see God work in a more powerful way than when we're just by ourselves. Listen to the importance of seeing us as a as a community, as a as a uh, a group of people who follow Jesus Christ together. I'm reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. It says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have, were not, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Is anybody grateful that you have received the mercy of God? Raise your hand. What I want you to notice about this passage is the word you. That word you is not singular, it is plural. It means the all. If you're from the South, you know what that means. Y'all. The word you is plural and is referring to us as, notice the words, a people, a priesthood, a nation. See the value of being a, a, a group that works together, that comes together. We are a chosen people that God cho chooses. God chooses us. God has called us. We are children of God. You ever take a minute to think about what that means? You're special. Not because of your own, just your own natural abilities and skills, but because you're a part of God's family. You're special. Because you choose to follow Jesus Christ and he has created you in a new cre as a new creation. He has changed your heart. Changed it from a heart of stone and given you a heart of flesh. You're an ambassador, a representative of Jesus Christ to the world. You are the salt of the earth and the light to the world. You've been adopted into God's family. God looks at you and calls you his son and his daughter. That's a uniqueness about us as the church. I want everybody to hold your thumb up. Like, you know, this is usually a, a positive thing. Thumbs up. Put your thumbs up. Everybody put your thumbs up. Now I want you to look around the room and look at everybody else and see their thumbs up. Here's what I want you to say. As a child of God, say that. As a child of God. I am. Somebody. <laughs> we are somebody because of what God has done for us. That's what makes us special. You know, all the people throughout the Bible, the, the things, the wonderful things that they did and they had written about, they weren't talented in their own strength. They were just surrendered to their God. And that's what made them special. That's what made them powerful. That's what made them successful. That's what made them who they became and who we know them as of today. And it's the same for us. We are the church that began with Adam and Eve. We are the church that began with Israel. We are the church today that began with Jesus Christ and his first 12 disciples. We are somebody. That's something to celebrate. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. Because it's important to believe that because the world wants to constantly bombard us with other messages that say you're nobody. The, the world wants to bombard us with messages that say you have no value, that you're insignificant, you have no authority and no power. We need to remind ourselves of this truth that God speaks to us, that God promises us these promises that we can stand upon to know our position and purpose that God has given us. 
need to believe in the power that God is using to work through us, through us, and the purpose that God gives us that enables us to accomplish his will. If you doubt it, you live without it. If you doubt it, you live without it. If you believe it, you receive it. And the women, it's so important that we believe the, the status, the place that God has equipped us and given us. We are privileged. We're not better than those that don't know Jesus. But we are better than we were. Because we are children of God. Because he's given us a purpose to, to preach the gospel to all the world as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Because we are his family. We need to celebrate that. We need to remember that position when people try to tell us that, oh, Christianity is dying and the churches are all closing and they're all dying and it's just not any relevance in anymore. So many people think that, that being a follower of Jesus Christ, being a church is no longer relevant. All men and women, it is the most relevant thing in this world. The church is still the only hope of this nation, of the world. Think about it. God has made a plan. And it's weird. It's, it's strange. It's sometimes hard to believe. But God says, I, I am a perfect God and I have a perfect plan and I'm going to fulfill that perfect, that perfect plan through imperfect people. That's an amazing God who can, can take our fracturedness, our brokenness, this, our willingness to disobey and, and still commit sin. And he takes all that and he says, I don't want that for you, but I can still work through you. I can still work through imperfect people to fulfill my perfect will. That should give us great confidence so we can do anything if we just willingly surrender to his leadership in spite of my faults, in spite of your faults, God can work amazing and incredible things if we believe in that. If we believe it enough that it makes us step forward in action instead of sitting in our pews. Amen? Amen. God has no plan B. We are it, the church. And it will accomplish His will. I want you to listen to a song, a special music. As you listen to it, I want you to meditate on its lyrics. I want you to listen to the words and meditate on them. I want you to listen to the heart of the singer as she describes her thoughts about God's presence with her, with us, as the church, and, and, and expressing her desire to know God more. Listen to the song. 